Okay, I'd like to talk about the case of Madeleine McCann and um, look at a question in particular about Madeleine McCann's parent supporters, by the McCann supporters. Um, my question is, do they not see the lies told? Are, are they missing something? And um, what are most people's reactions, that sort of thing? So I'd like to look at that, and, and I'll get to that um, but a few points first about the case itself. Over the years, there's been quite a, a great deal of reaction. Uh, many of it is an emotionally laden reaction um, from the UK and from the United States. I sometimes think of the uh, Madeleine McCann case as the uh, John Benet Ramsey case that was in here in the States uh, of the UK. And so I think there's some similarities there that are worth pointing out. In the analysis of the parents' statements, we have from the very beginning deception indicated. Now this is something that, and I'll get to exactly how that's found, but this is something that um, I've not found contested anywhere. I've not found any analyst or, or even second or third hand information that says, no, the analysis is incorrect. It's, it's not a difficult analysis. Um, it's good for teaching beginner work. And it goes back to the Solomonic decision uh, of the mother with the dead child, the mother with the living child, uh, that many of you are familiar with from the Bible, where a, a woman was in the highest state of distress that she could possibly be in. Uh, someone has taken her child from her. And Solomon appealed to the maternal instinct. And I recognize that um, psychotropic medications can alter reality uh, just as any type of intoxication can, alter someone's perception of reality. But in the case of the McCanns, they spoke so often and under various circumstances that it would be something that we would have picked up that's not there. When someone goes missing, when a child goes missing, the parental instinct is engaged dramatically, acutely. And what the person is going to say is, Madeline's been kidnapped. She's out there. We've got to get to the kidnapper. We've got to help her. Do you know what she's going through right now? And that's going to be their emphasis. And even under accusations from the public, there's a certain dismissal of that of innocent parents. They don't care. Um, there's many examples of this. Uh, you can look in the blog and, uh, of missing children, of innocent parents and how they speak. So the McCann case is not difficult. And, and what I said by difficult, I mean there's, we pick up sensitivity indicators as a scientific process. Um, I'm happy. I'm very happy. Now very is to happiness. So we're going to explore that. I'm very, very happy. I'm very, very, very happy. Now we see a lot of sensitivity around happiness, and so we want to explore why. We don't always know. So when someone says, well, they use the word very, they must be lying. That's not true. They could be, but it's not necessarily so. It needs exploration, and dependent upon the analyst's background, experiences, how many interviews conducted, how many statements analyzed, that sort of thing, they may dis decide to ascribe a higher or lower level of sensitivity to any particular word as they go through it. So if someone says, I'm very, very, very happy, and some of you automatically are thinking depression, and you're possibly right. What we do is we pose questions to the use of the word. Why the need to tell me this, and why the need to tell me this now? The first answer, or the first source of an answer we look for is in the statement itself to explain itself, and often that does happen. Sometimes it doesn't happen until after the case breaks, uh, in the interview process, in evidence that comes out, and then we understand what this sensitivity may be from. And so in training we have Analysts and students learning to ask questions, and it's very important. It's very important psychologically to ask questions. 
I recommend a video on YouTube called The Power of Questions by Frank Marsh. It's an excellent video from uh, someone I consider perhaps the most naturally gifted teacher I've ever encountered in my life. I've had some good ones. The Power of Questions, Frank Marsh. The Power of Questions is not only to probe and to look for answers, but it protects us. We all have prejudices. Recently I was reading about um, a baseball player who, wants, who was suspended for life from Major League Baseball who wants to be reinstated, Pete Rose. And the things that he has done look really bad. I recognize that I looked up to him when I was a young boy, so there was an emotional impact and a conflict. So I have to ask myself, would I want to give him a pass on his misdeeds if it was today, as an adult? Because um, while we're going through changes hormonally, um, we are very impressionable, and those impressions stay with us for a lifetime. So this emotional connection I had towards um, a baseball player, who I only saw on television, who I emulated and tried to copy the best I could, but emulated it, particularly his uh, work ethic, who has, like all flawed human beings, done things he shouldn't have done. And so, where does that lead us? I've had um, a few seminars where someone inevitably says, hey, did Michael Jackson molest children? So I pull out a few Michael Jackson statements and say, yeah, he did. Uh, and as a matter of fact, he had victims all over the world, according to his language. Inevitably, someone, uh, particularly in this case a female, was a teenager when Michael Jackson's album Thriller came out. And it meant shut down, can't hear anymore. It would be similar to me, male, boy, 10, 11 years old, Little League, Pete Rose. How can that be? How, how could he not be um, honest, for example? And so we all have that struggle. When, um, when I did the original analysis on that documentary, um, the reaction was tremendous. And what, by tremendous, I mean by volume-wise. And it ranged from everything from many people having a certain type of opinion down to a few who had a very different opinion. Um, and a lot of those opinions meant personal attacks and um, accusations. Uh, we had one man who had gone back to university for a degree in psychology who was contacting superiors of detectives who had given recommendations for my work. He was attempting to intimidate, obviously. Um, just an unbalanced person who should not be around children at risk, which was what he was going towards. Um, what was his expectation that I would demand that the documentary be taken down or change my opinion because he's trying to intimidate? Does that make the McCanns innocent? The McCanns didn't tell us Madeline was kidnapped. And this went on for a long time in terms of the interviews. And you, uh, I think people saw the defensive posture, but they also saw a, a cute little face of a little girl a baby who was missing. And so there's an emotional reaction with that. Um, the first pictures that came out of the John Benet Ramsey case uh, were heartbreaking. A cute little girl. And then media got a hold of some of the uh, sexualized pictures. And then the parents spoke. And then we knew. John and Patsy Ramsey were indicted on uh, John Benet's death via child abuse. And the district attorney in a it's the only case I know of uh, this has happened, refused to sign the indictment. He did not want to go up against the high-powered uh, attorneys from Atlanta. They also did not make a linguistic commitment. And that's what we look for. So I pulled this one out. This is on Gannon Stouch, and this is the stepmother, and, and I think many of you are familiar with this. Saturday night, G was helping me unload in the garage, cut his foot, and cut his foot because there are a lot of tools because Albert does woodworking. So one of the questions we'd ask in a, in a beginning class is, did G, Gannon, 
cut his foot on a tool? Yes or no? And the answer is we don't know because she hasn't told us. Was Madeline McCann kidnapped? I can't say she was kidnapped because the parents refused to say it over and over and over. And this is going to take the beating. And of course, at subsequent interviews, people can then prepare more. And, um, but we're looking especially at the early interviews. Those that vehemently defend the McCanns are willing to say what the McCanns themselves were not willing to say. That's how strange this is. I'm going to look at the, the emotional increase there. So it, it's a strange case. So we look at this. Saturday night, G was helping me unload in the garage and cut his foot. On what? She doesn't say. She does say, here's the reason why he cut his foot. And those of you that are familiar with some of the tools of analysis will recognize that no one was asking her why. Not only is she telling us why, she's doubling down on it. This is a, a very strong signal that she is being deceptive here. In order for you to conclude that G cut his foot on the tools, you'll have to say for her what she herself did not say. We listen to people. We listen to their words rather than interpreting them. She may infer this, but we're listening. When a, a child goes missing, um, there's a disruption of human nature, parental capacities. We can't help them now. There's a, a frustration that's very deep. And the greatest concern is what the child's experiencing. Now, Gannon's mother spoke out, and she was indicated for veracity. And one of the things that she said was, put yourself in Gannon's shoes. What do you think he's experiencing? This was her way of trying to help people overcome any fear they would have of calling 911 and making a report. She was showing empathy with the victim, with, in this case, her son. That's called a linguistic disposition. Um, I had an interesting and kind of a comical experience recently where after a hockey game, I took home the wrong hockey stick. And so in a group text, it was asked, hey, who has my stick? And so I checked and I realized that's not mine. But I wrote back saying, has the thief been caught? The gentleman who stole the, hockey, the red hockey stick or the red tape hockey stick. That had two indicators of deception in there, is I identify the thief as a gentleman, and I also talked about the color of the stick, meaning I've handled it. Just two little hints there to have a little fun with. Well, this type of detecting deception wasn't challenging on the McCann analysis. And so a lot of the reactions, most of the reactions are people, came from people that were either open-minded about it or they believed that the McCanns didn't do it, but they had their doubts. Why did they have their doubts? What caused them to have doubts here? And then everything in the middle, and the greater the emotional response to something like this, um, the more difficult it can be to be open-minded. Here, the stepmother is letting us know the police will probably find blood in the garage. And she has a need to explain in an extremely sensitive way why that is without telling us what happened. Without telling us that he cut his, his, self, his foot on a tool. And so the lack of linguistic commitment is something that we look at, especially with a missing child and a parent or a um, a caretaker or a close relative. As a priority, it is, my child's been kidnapped and what is she going through? The linguistic disposition towards the child should be like me writing about the inadvertent taking of the hockey stick. Was the gentleman caught? I'm calling him a gentleman. It's me. We don't like to accuse ourselves overly harshly. What was the level of care of the McCanns? And um, this, I believe, is something that people have misread. People that believe that they caused the death of 
Madeline had misread as sociopathic. I don't see sociopathy in the language of the McCanns. And that gets some people very angry, like, how could someone be so calloused? Um, human nature is very complex. And how the McCanns spoke, especially in those early interviews, indicated they had already processed her death and she was beyond help. So they moved on to the twins. And they can tell themselves, put yourselves in their shoes, they can tell themselves that we can't tell the truth because they might take away our other two children. And we didn't do this on purpose. Now, um, I don't know how Madeline died. I know from the parents that she was not alive, and I know from the parents that they hid the body incredibly well from their own language, from Kate's own language. But I don't know how she died. I have an idea, but I don't know specifically. I think, and it's based upon language, that she was sedated so they could go out. That is something that enrages people but I've had experience with it before. I've dealt with a, quite a number of parents that have given their children cough syrup or uh, Benadryl or something like that to get them to sleep. But one experience in particular stands out for me, even though it was many years ago. A doctor was accused of giving parents his own brand of cough syrup that was knocking the kids out to sleep. He lost his license, and um, it didn't end well. But I interviewed him. And in the interview process, the interviewer always goes in with the most neutral stance possible. Now, as a parent, I had to deal with my own emotions. You're drugging kids? Talking about it with someone who always works quite well and bringing them down and then asking what happened, what happened next, tell me more about yourself, tell me more about these parents, what did you do? He explained to me that he wanted me to understand him. He told me that there were so many cases of abusive parents in his practice, most of it doing with, dealing with substance abuse that he said it doesn't rise to a level where the state can remove the child and these parents are so bad that the child is safer sleeping and it's really low dose and that's how he justified it so he could go from being a, a, in one person's view a sociopathic monster to someone who thinks he's doing right pragmatically to save children from abuse. And I needed to see it from his perspective in the interview process. We enter into their language the best we can to understand them. Um, on the recent case of the little girl Faye that was found uh, killed by the neighbor, the analysis concluded that the, um, the mother's 911 call was truthful and that the family statement indicated neglect. And that's because it's a short statement and the priority was showing, hey, I'm a good mother. And that's not good. This is while the, the child was missing. It's not criminal neglect. It's in the language of the statement. In the 911 call, the priority was the child, finding the child, getting neighbors and, and searching everywhere. That was the priority. Help me. Find my daughter. Um, and she was truthful. Regrettably, she'll suffer with the idea of not watching a little girl for the rest of her life. Uh, someone that is um, worthy of our prayers to that she would receive mercy. But it's a terrible thing to live with. I see the McCanns in a similar way. I disagree with what they did. 
or why did I uh, conclude that they had drugged her, medicated her, sedated her? You know, isn't that a form of chemical restraint? In, in a sense, it is. That's what the doctor with the cough syrup was doing as well, and that's what some parents do with Benadryl, uh, allergy medication. Out of anything that Kate could talk about with her last hours with Madeline, well, she went to the mouth. She went to giving her something to eat. Um, and that's an indication for me. The fact that she was an anesthesiologist uh, means something as well, but um, I don't know that for sure. Then there's the claim of sexual abuse. And this um, sometimes gets very intense with people. If there was sexual abuse in her life, it's not in the statements that I analyzed. So I, I can only stay within a statement. I can't go outside that statement. It may be true, but I don't know that and can't say it. I didn't see anything in the language to indicate it. So the reactions to this at times can really be quite, um, quite a roller coaster. I've spent quite a uh, time, and others have too, deleting comments and blocking on Facebook and that sort of thing because of where it goes. But most people here have reacted with some form of openness. Um, some of it, I knew it. I knew that. I just didn't know how to say that. Well, what happened was, why are people who believe the McCanns inadvertently, for example, killed their daughter, why are they so angry? Why are they still following this case for all these years? It's the fault of the McCanns. Every time we tell a lie to someone, we're showing contempt for them. For me to lie to another person means I have to think of them as not intelligent enough to discern this. And as people listened, especially in the early interviews to the case, they, they um, could not help but see the news interviewer's emotional reaction, that's going to be an influence, the little girl's cute face, and then listening to the parents' words. And the parents seemed to show a lot of concern for themselves, and not any concern at times, not any concern at all, for what the child was going through. And that didn't sit right. But people having their own children and not wishing to think ill of others, put that aside, but it, it causes a lingering doubt. And then the McCann spoke again, and again, and again. And the more they spoke, the more people realized these people have a need to persuade rather than relying on the truth. They're concealing it. And it, it, what it did was it, it uncovered their doubts, the, the, the audience's doubts, in the beginning and solidified them. And it made sense to them. So uh, of the many, of, um, thank you for the analysis. It, it's really great. Um, I think I knew this all along. And then down a little tier is those that I was undecided, and I see it now. And then down a few more tiers would be those that um, said, you know, I've always believed they didn't do it. And in listening to you, not interpret their words, but just listen to them, I now see differently. And then lastly, we have the few who, um, who appear to me to be obsessed with a cause. And this is actually very sad. Um, it's not so much that they believe the parents, it's that belief in the parents is their cause in life. And this is usually caused by some, some form of severe vacuum in their lives. And so they will um, post nasty insults and taunts and um, try to cause trouble any way they can, try to silence dissent. Because remember, those that question the analysis, they're actually helping. They're helping. Um, this is the type of science that should be constantly tried and proven, constantly tested, constantly under scrutiny. It's good, it's healthy. Um, sometimes things that are sensitive and we, we think that they led here, later on we find out, no, they led here. They're still sensitive points, but they led the wrong direction. 
use more caution, that sort of thing. And this is good for growth. And then language shifts and changes. Um, 15 years ago, we weren't telling people to go ahead and Google something. So now we have a new verb to use and, and we'll look at how that works. Or abbreviations and text messages. And tomorrow language will change again and we'll change with it. But down here among the few, the anger is acute. And it's as if an entire life is dedicated to saying for the McCanns what the McCanns were incapable of saying for themselves. And they see anyone who doesn't agree with them as an enemy. Um, one of the things that I've heard a lot over the years is, um, you did it for profit. So I, I, I wonder, there's some truth to that, in a, in a sense that if a news story breaks and a journalist breaks that news, the news is horrible, the journalist may have an increase in his or her career on bad news. And I don't think it's wrong to look at motives. First, answer the analysis. Tell me where the analysis is wrong. Tell me why something doesn't mean what it says it means. And then I think it's fair to look at, was someone funded by the McCanns or someone funded by the anti-McCanns? That sort of thing. I, I don't think it's wrong to look at the motive, but first look at the analysis and the facts themselves. The emotion is such that it seems to never cool off. And what does that tell you about their opinion of the analysis? I believe many of them, from looking at their words before the deletions, <laughs> um, the level of rage is out of fear fear that they know this wonderful looking couple, this handsome couple of professionals really did it. They may not believe um, some of the, you know, the child trafficking and the uh, sex abuse claims, that sort of thing, and there's always that constant looking and a constant point of demarcation going further and further from each other. But I believe from their language that they know and it is as if to bring harm to who they identify themselves to be, like some kind of champion catcher in the rye, savior of children. The McCanns told us through their language that we need not be concerned with what Madeline was experiencing. She was beyond their help. She was beyond our help. Um, the McCanns are free to file a suit against me, which I believe would allow me to ask questions of them as well. When someone speaks publicly, you're free to agree or disagree. You're free to say, this person is telling the truth. No, this person is lying. That's inherent in someone that chooses to speak publicly. I think that the level of rage, the personal animosity, is such that it is a cover for the fear of knowing you know, she's not kidnapped, she's not age progressed someplace, and she's not waiting for the cans to go and find her. Um, I think also that for the, the many up here, I think the McCann's fundraising, um, some of their ties with media and politicians uh, has become a source of anger They've always been on the defensive. They have always um, expressed the concern for themselves. And I recognize that that will mimic at least a sociopathic-like personality. But if you look at it in context, it appears to me to be isolated just to this context, just to this particular case, not all of life. So I don't agree with those that um, see them as sociopaths. I don't think that they deliberately harmed her. I don't know about any sexual abuse. I know that sexual abuse is more prevalent than most of us know, myself included. Um, it's one of the things that analysts will sometimes say after a number of statements that they work together as a team. Is, has everyone been abused? The abuse is widespread and it's gotten worse in our society 
over the last few decades. So I believe the McCann analysis is not something that is controversial, um, nor something that is difficult. It's good to study and to follow the flow of information from the McCanns, to let their words guide you, and then to say, I can't put words in their mouths that they themselves don't use. And then that becomes the bottom line. When it becomes a cause in life, um, there's much wrong with that behind the scenes.